Now on Radio 4, it's time for Any Questions with Chris Mason. Hello, we're in Cardiff this weekend. Our hosts are the St Tylo's Church in Wales High School. There are 1,500 pupils here, educated in a gleamingly modern building that is just six years old. We're in the school hall in the company of a few hundred local people. And on our panel, the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps for the Conservatives, Labour's Stephen Kinnock, Delleth Jewell, who sits in the Welsh Assembly for the Welsh Nationalist Plaid Cymru, and Ben Habib, who is a member of the European Parliament for the Brexit Party. Ladies and gentlemen, your Any Questions panel. And our first question comes from Jude Penny. Hello, Jude. Good evening. Um, The response of the general public to today's attack in London demonstrated the innate desire, the human desire, to help each other. To what extent do the main parties' manifestos also demonstrate this desire? Let's start with Grant Chaps for the Conservatives and, of course, speaking on behalf of the government. First of all, the the events uh, that we've seen did bring out the best and the worst in in, uh, in, in human beings, as, as the question rightly points out. So just extraordinary to think of people uh, not knowing whether that was a real vest uh, or not, um, apprehending uh, somebody before the uh, police arrived. And just pay tribute to the authorities, to the police and uh, the British Transport Police as well and others, um, as well as members of the public in, in doing that. Look, in terms of, uh, you know, comparisons to a, a manifesto, I, I think that you know, good responsible government is about doing a whole load of things at the, different, at the same time. And it, it's tempting in a manifesto to think all you need to do is to everybody who's written to you about anything that they need uh, at any time, any pressure group, any, any, any block of people, just say yes. And that, that might somehow be the responsible thing to do. But I think a responsible, a truly responsible government has to remember that all of this that stuff has to be paid for um, somewhere down the line. And that our responsibility isn't just to this generation and the people voting in this election, but it is, in fact, to society for decades, possibly to, 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 go, to come. Um, so, I mean, I think a, a, a balanced manifesto, which obviously I would suggest the Conservative uh, manifesto uh, for government is, uh, takes both of those things into account. It both spends more money because we have now reached the end of austerity and we're able to do that with the deficit much closer to being in balance, um, but at the end of the five-year parliament, would see debt no higher, in fact, lower as a proportion um, uh, of the economy than it was before. And I think that is a responsible way to run government. Uh, for Labour, Stephen Kinnock. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd just like to start by saying my, my thoughts go out to uh, the people that were, have been affected by this uh, appalling attack today. Um, and I think the, um, our emergency services and our police have done an absolutely fantastic job, but the passers-by as well who've showed incredible courage and presence of mind to do what they did, I, I think is a real tribute to the, to the human spirit that the question uh, implied. Um, in terms of where we are uh, and the manifestos, I, I think we've got to recall the, the context that we're, we're living now in a, in a country, the fifth uh, biggest economy in the world, where there are four million children living in poverty, where... Uh, millions of parcels are being given out every day, uh, every week, and every month in food banks, uh, where we have a, a massive gap between uh, the wealthiest at the top of our economy, 1%. The top 1% own 24% of the wealth in this country. Now, I don't think that the state can fix all of that, but it has to play a role in terms of creating a platform uh, for uh, the poorest in our society to come together Uh, with others so that we can reunite our deeply divided country, in my view. But I see that community spirit in Wales all the time. I see it in the people who volunteer in the food bank in my constituency. I see it in the people that come together to save the library services because of the uh, massive cuts that have been imposed on local authorities that have led to libraries being threatened with closure. So this isn't only about the state. This is about human beings coming together in community. And I think that Wales 
is the beating heart of that sense of community in our country. But what we need is a state that can enable that, because at the moment we're trying to do this with one arm tied behind our backs. And what we need is the radical but realistic policies that are put forward in Labour's manifesto so that we can enable that radical transformation of our country that is so desperately needed. Dallas Jewel of Plaid Cymru. Well, I would like to thank uh, to start by also saying that my thoughts are obviously with uh, the people who were caught up in that tragic incident uh, earlier today. I think it was Fred Rogers that he'd said that whenever he would see a horrible event like that happening, he'd say, always look for the helpers. You always see people helping. And I, I mean, I agree with a lot of what's already been said. I think that politics has to be about helping people. Now, Unfortunately, um, I, I, I would have to disagree with what Grant had said about uh, the conservative take on austerity. I think that uh, the, uh, the spending pledges in the conservative manifesto go to show that it's a tacit admission that austerity has failed as a project. I, I think that we should be prioritizing helping people uh, rather than trying to keep down these remote numbers and I think that it, it's shocking that we are living in a society that as has already been said where people are having to go to food banks in order to to feed their families I think that it strikes to the heart of what is important in a society we should be we should judge ourselves by how we look after the most vulnerable people in society that mm -hmm. has to be at the heart of what we are doing in politics okay Because if, if, if we're not in politics in order to help people, then okay. why on earth would we be here? Uh, ben have even a second. Just a brief response, Grant Shapps, to, uh, to Della's point there, briefly. If yeah, you and, and actually it wraps up with what Stephen was saying as well. He talked about the poverty and inequality in society, but yet there are three, three quarters of a million fewer children living in workless households. There are 400,000 fewer people in absolute... Well, look, we can... We, hold, hold on a minute, hold on. If we're going to actually have this discussion based on facts rather than just, you know, uh, uh, you know quoting figures without any background, there are 400,000 fewer people living in absolute poverty. And income inequality is actually down uh, lower than under 12, uh, any time under 12 years. Now, if you know otherwise, and the ONS has got this wrong, we can have that discussion. But the point is that actually, unless you're dealing with the facts as they actually are, and these are facts from the Office of National Statistics, not my facts, okay. then it's very difficult to have a debate about future manifestos. I'll bring Delith back in in a second, but Ben Habib first, because uh, you've been waiting patiently. Uh, so I think the question um, was bringing people together. What are we doing in our manifestos to bring people together? And... Um, uh, before I answer that, just to endorse what my co-panelists have said, obviously today was an awful day. Um, the British public acted typically as the British public do with great bravery and selflessness in the way that they reacted to it. And I am very, very proud of our security services as well. Um, it is a testimony to successive governments, and I'm the Brexit party, so this is quite a giveaway, a testimony to successive governments and obviously Grant is in government now, that our security services handle it so well. But bringing people together in the manifesto isn't really about what we saw today. What we've, what we've experienced in the last three years is a schism in our country. And that has been caused by Brexit. But what we've seen as a result of that is a complete breakdown in the political system. We've had a constitutional crisis. Um, and in that crisis, we've seen arguably a partisan speaker. We've seen MPs elected to Parliament. I said arguably. It depends on which side of the debate you're on. Um, we've seen MPs, and this is a fact, cross the floor without standing for by-election. We've had Parliament prorogued um, against the will of many people. We've had the Supreme Court step in and have to put it right. And what we need more than anything, and what is conspicuously absent from the manifestos of both the Labour Party and the Tory Party, is a meaningful attempt at putting right what's gone wrong in our political system. And the Labour Party and the Tory Party have effectively exchanged the reins of power mm -hmm. for God knows how many years, and it's time that changed, and we had proper change in our politics, and we changed politics for good. Let's, um, 
Before we change, uh, before we change topic, uh, Dunneth Jill, you were wanting to come back on, I think, what Grant Shapps was saying, but if you could keep it brief. I will keep it very brief, Chris. I, I just think that, well, Grant was talking about uh, however many fewer thousands of people are struggling. I think that that statistic well, no, will be of little comfort to the people who are still struggling terribly. But, I just wanted but, to yeah, remind people. I just, yeah, I, will, yeah. I just wanted... But, but I just be, wanted very briefly to remind but, but people... But to be clear, Dunneth, you're, you're not actually disputing the statistic. I, well, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure where the statistic comes from, but the I think that any people who are struggling are too many people struggling. That's and I would just like to, uh, to point out that last year, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty came to the UK and found that there was systematic poverty here because okay. of ideological cuts to public services. That is not a civilised society. <laughs> Two sentences, if you can manage it, Grant, and then we'll move on. It is, of course, true that one person living in poverty is one person too many. That is a statement of the obvious. But the fact that there are 400,000 fewer people living in absolute poverty is, is of course, important. Okay. And uh, hold on one second. The Economist today's front page, I've got it right in front of me, inequality illusions, why people keep imagining that the gap between the rich and the poor uh, is uh, is wider than it really is. The truth is, inequality <laughs> has shrunk. Well, it's the economy. Oh, okay. 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 uh, let's uh, let's move on uh, to our second question, please. Good evening, Nasrita. What are your solutions to combating the climate emergency? Thank you for your uh, question. It's quite striking looking at all of the party manifestos that if it is possible to put Brexit to one side, the one thing that runs through all of them to a greater or lesser extent is a focus on the environment to a far greater degree than perhaps has ever featured before. And I noticed that it has been a, quite a general election for trees already, with parties trying to outdo each other on trees, Labour even promising 12,400 an hour every hour, 24 hours a day for 20 years, if my math is anything to go by. And there's plenty of other numbers on trees that I won't bore you with. Um, where should we start? Ben Habib. Well, reforestation is a very important part of it, and a central part of our contract with the people is reforestation. It's interesting, um, for example, that the signature policy of the European Union is the common agricultural policy. And, of course, the common agricultural policy keeps deployed in farming use land that could and should actually in many respects be redeployed um, for reforestation. We grow many things in this country which would be much cheaper to be imported. We keep French farmers um, you know, in jobs when they shouldn't be in jobs. We could, you're, we could, you're pro French farming unemployment, we could, are you? We could, uh, we could save 20% on food bills by exiting the European Union and getting rid of the tariffs. Okay. Getting rid of the tariffs that the European Union imposes on food. And the common agricultural policy, I mean, it's very interesting, you know, the Labour Party goes on about how the European Union um, is a force for good in the environment, but actually it isn't. Its signature policy is damaging to the environment. Let me just give you one more example. It's perhaps more tangible, but it evidences and reveals the hypocrisy at the centre of the European Union, and that is that we move from Brussels to Strasbourg every month at a cost of over £100 million a year just to keep the French government happy. It makes no sense at all. OK, on the, on the specifics of forestation, um, all of the other parties on our panel tonight have got specific numbers as far as yeah. their promise is concerned. Your manifesto talks about millions of new trees but doesn't put a figure on it. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to tonight? Well, I, I don't want to put a figure on it. We need to look at what's deliverable in a cost-effective manner. But what is obviously not deliverable as indeed is obvious from a lot of the pledges made by the Labour Party, is 2,000 trees every minute. OK, well, let's put that to, to Stephen uh, Kinnock. Yeah, 12,400 trees every hour, Stephen Kinnock, for 20 years. Is that doable? Yes, it is. And I, I heard a, an, a pretty amazing statistic today that in Ethiopia, they planted 300 million trees in one day. So don't tell me that it can't be done. Don't tell me that it can't be done. We, we, need to, we need to get away from this deeply cynical attitude that it just can't be done. Let's leave it to the market. Let's have a do-nothing manifesto that, in essence, is just about damage limitation. So, so where would... Let's, let's actually have 
the confidence in our beliefs. And I'm so Ben from, from a background about take back control. And yet he seems to have no faith in the British people and the British government to actually transform this planet okay. for the better so and to pay, play a major, that, make a major contribution to that. Given that you think that promise is deliverable, um, where would these trees go? At what cost? On what land would they be? Who would be planting them? Because if it's deliverable, you can presumably answer those questions. Well, you, we need uh, to reform the way in which uh, planning is uh, working so that that is actually facilitating the planting of these trees. There's a the whole range of measures. Uh, Chris, I'm, I'm not, you may be looking for a gotcha moment here. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely not. I'm, not I'm, I'm, I'm looking, a gotcha at, a, I'm looking at a I promise am. you've made and asking you if it's deliverable. Look, I, we have to understand that the planet is burning and the ice caps are melting. We're seeing more and more extreme weather events every day. And to address that challenge, we're going to need a whole suite of policies on everything from a uh, healthy environment, dealing with pollution, making sure that the polluters pay, because what we've seen under the Tories, of course, is the facilitation of those large energy companies, uh, the massive, powerful lobby uh, that they have within the Conservative Party, and that is having a direct influence on policy. Uh, what we also have in our manifesto is a clear commitment to finally the electrification of the railway line all the way to Swansea, something that the Tories have basically rescinded on completely, and vitally the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. And in nine years of... <laughs> nine, nine years of short-sightedness, of self-defeating austerity, and frankly of cowardice in terms of facing the challenges that our country faces, perhaps one of the most uh, cowardly decisions that we've seen from this government was the decision not to go ahead with the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. What an opportunity for Wales okay. to be the leading edge of a new technology, a global pioneer in this um, extremely reliable, totally clean uh, uh, form of new, uh, new form of green energy. Uh, and a Labour government will deliver on that. At Dulles, Jewel. Whenever we talk about something to do with the climate emergency, I get this sense that we've all been fiddling with things like Brexit as the planet burns. You know, you get this, this glimpse almost into the abyss of all this that we should have been concentrating on, but we've been focusing all of our efforts on this. I'm not trying to, to say that Brexit is not an important issue. Of course it is, but climate emergency, that is the defining challenge of our age and so far, there, have, there has not been enough uh, done and we are running out of time. So in terms of what Plaid Cymru would do, we, would, uh, we have plans for a green jobs revolution that would be a multi-billion pound investment in renewable energy, but also in, in reforming uh, and improving our public transport infrastructure. And it, those plans would make us single-use plastic free and carbon neutral by 2030. How would and, you make that happen? So we have a plan to... It, we would raise... £20 billion pounds over 10 years, and that would come from asking the UK government to invest, an, well, to borrow an extra 1% of GDP, which is still far below what a lot of countries, including Germany, do. And, uh, you know, at this time of low interest rates, now is the time to invest in our future. And uh, just to point out that I am, at the moment, the, the world's first shadow minister for the future, and when Plaid Cymru win our next Senate election in 2021, I will be the fir world's first Minister for the Future, so this is something which is absolutely going to be at the centre <laughs> of and what, what everything. What happens if you get well, sacked? You'll then be the... <laughs> As I mean, the Minister for the Future, this, can you, get, you tell you... us what's happening on the 12th of December? <laughs> <laughs> and also, if you ever get moved on, you'll be the past Minister for the Future. <laughs> um, <laughs> Grant Schatz for the uh, Conservatives. I've been, um, I've become a bit tree obsessed in the last yeah. 24 hours, as you may have. have 30 you, as, millions. Yeah, answer. 30 million, yeah. which is a third of Labour's, but it's still quite a lot of trees. It is. Um, and before this uh, Parliament broke up, I was working out how much um, space we had on Department of Transport land, which includes all the network rail and all the rest of it. And there's an awful lot of it there, I think. Not that we can build them in the middle of the railways. But I do have to say, I think, you know, everyone on this panel will be agreed now, I hope, um, of the need to, tra to, to tackle uh, climate change. And there have been some remarkable um, figures. For example, for the first time last year, over half of our energy 
was produced by renewable um, sources, 53%. percent is an extraordinary achievement, considering where we came from. 99% of all the solar panels in this country have been installed since 2010. There have been enormous steps forward, 90% reduction in the amount of uh, plastic bags being um, used. And what, what I want to do, as a transport secretary, what I want to do is now go on to the electrification of transport. It produces about a third of the toxins, a third Can of CO2. Can you electrify the South Wales um, line, as you oh, promised? Hold on a second. I'll come, I'll come back to that in a second. To Swansea, please. See, I'll come back to that. Um, although, although, Stephen, I have to say, coming from the party that in 13 years managed to electrify 13 miles of track, in the entire time you guys were in office. It's a little bit rich taking these uh, lectures, but coming back to 13 miles of track were electrified under the last Labour government, whereas we've gone and electrified hundreds of miles of track. So tell us what you want to do in the so future. So let's just talk about the, let's talk about the cars. Uh, electrification of cars is a really important um, area. I drive an electric car myself, the fantastic vehicles to drive, but there's an amazing challenge to make sure that we have enough uh, charging points in place, and we're making massive progress. For example... More, there are now more charging locations for electric cars in this country than there are petrol stations. So we are getting the balance there where I think it's about to break through and we're seeing this year a massive increase in the uptake of electric vehicles. And we're saying we're going to um, bring forward the date when uh, electric vehicles uh, are the replacement rather than being able to buy petrol and diesel. Is the HS2 rail line green and is your current, what reads like a wobble in your manifesto as whether you're keen on it or not, is the environmental element around it part of the factor? Both of those things for me are open questions for which the uh, review uh, is going to provide answers. Because look, I mean, is it's it a, a massive... genuine review or is it you it's trying to win it's a pro it's HS2 and anti HS2 it, voters in a couple it, of weeks? It's a genuine review. We didn't know there was an election on when it, when it, it was um, set up and actually has people who feel very, very strongly on both sides of the review. It's a massive amount of money to invest. And I want to be clear before we do it that it's actually going to be worth doing uh, and whether the benefits are there in return. So it's a, it's a proper review. It includes the environmental aspect. And uh, listeners may know that I asked um, the HS2 people to pause uh, the destruction of uh, ancient forests whilst the review was going on wherever they could without delaying timetables, um, because I think it is important that whatever happens, it is an environmentally friendly railway if it goes ahead. Come to our next question in a second, but Stella, if you were just wanting to check Just quickly, in. on HS2, Grant, could you just tell us, you're talking about how you want to make sure it is a good investment and that people get the benefit. Wales isn't going to get any benefit from HS2, are we? I mean, so it's a vanity project that's England only, but we don't get a direct well, carnet consequential I mean, for it. I'm mean, pointing out the obvious, it's a north-south railway line and north, uh, down, down England, the middle of the country. Uh, well, so, it, so you're absolutely right. And one of the reasons why I want to be so clear... One of the reasons why I want to be so clear about it is that um, you're right, it's a heck of a lot of money to spend. And actually, well, if there's money to be spent, I want to make sure it's spent in a way that benefits the whole country, including Wales. That's one of the very good reasons Oh, it's not one country, Grant. I would, I, would just, I, would, I would just say that it just seems to stick in the teeth a little that this is money for okay. a high-speed north-south link for England, when in Wales we don't have a north-south rail link at all. Um, sorry, sorry. Just, 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 to be entirely, just to be entirely clear, um, Welsh Rail is a matter for Transport for Wales. Uh, so it's actually a Welsh government responsibility. It, well, it's at, not completely devolved, so at, at we, we At that point, we will draw a discreet veil over the Dalith and Grant show, although it may be back on the radio within a matter of moments. You never know. Uh, let me tell you about uh, Any Answers, which follows the Saturday edition uh, of uh, Any Questions at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. And each Arnand is awaiting your calls for... 44 minutes of uh, your perspectives on what you're hearing on the programme. 03700 100 444. 03700 100 444. And a quick mention of next week. We're going to be in Chesterfield next week at Brookfield School uh, in the company of a cabinet minister and a shadow cabinet minister, a Liberal Democrat and a SMP candidate as well. Now, shall we talk about another topic? I think we should, with uh, Janet Beauchamp. Is that right? Have I pronounced that right? Beecham. Janet Beecham. Not even remotely close. (laughs) Uh, Good French accent. (laughs) I barreled towards that and should have hesitated. But anyway, I didn't. Janet, Um, go for it. Um, When can we talk about social care? The Prime Minister seems reluctant to.
Now, this is a devolved issue, so there'll be reflections from a, a Welsh and an English and who knows, maybe a Scottish perspective as well. Uh, let's go to Stephen Kinnock for Labour first. Well, it's a very good question, Janet. In terms of the, the Prime Minister, known as the elusive Mr Boris Johnson, he doesn't seem to want to appear on TV debates. He doesn't seem to want to appear on the interview there with, uh, with Andrew Neil. Let's talk about social um, care. And he doesn't seem to want to give an answer on social care. Um, and, and, you know... What would you do? I, I, would I think... Right so so Labour has a, will be investing... Uh, £10.4 billion pounds in uh, the uh, free personal care for uh, over 65s. Is that for England? Uh, that, well, then, then there's a Barnet consequential. So there's a Barnet consequential for Wales of £3.4 billion pounds a year in our uh, spending plans. Just um, on that quickly. Hang on, hang on. Let, let Stephen okay. finish. Uh, and the, I think that this is a, an issue which has been... Uh, in need of resolution for a very, very long time. And, uh, you talked about clearly... big numbers there. In, in terms of the practical consequences for people day to day who are reliant on social care, how, how different would it be under a Labour government? Because that's what people care about, isn't it? Yeah, I think personal care is the critical issue here because that's what we are offering. Free personal care for anybody over the age of 65. And that means free care at your home, uh, and it's uh, both for people who are in physical need of care, but also, crucially, uh, people with uh, dementia and other uh, mental uh, needs, uh, and care needs, I should say. Uh, and that, I think, will be a critical difference, because uh, as things stand, it is totally unclear uh, where social care ends, where the NHS begins. Uh, what we've seen from Welsh Labour is a much more integrated approach, much more work done in terms of investing homes uh, to be care ready. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are, I think, ahead of the curve in Wales in terms of okay. uh, dealing with social care. I would very much like to see the UK government learning from the Welsh Labour government in this vitally important area. Just a, a quick explanation, uh, given where we are in Wales uh, this week and reflecting on a uh, devolved issue it mentioned there from Stephen Kinnock of Barnet Consequentials, a reference to the, to the, uh, the way that money is sent to the, the non-English bits of the UK as a result of spending increases that happen in England. I think that's a pithy and hopefully accurate explanation of what the, uh, yes. the Barnet uh, formula is. Um, Deneth, Deneth Jewell of Plaid Cymru. So Janet, thank you for your question. I mean, quickly to refer to the fact that you'd said that Boris Johnson doesn't seem to want to, uh, he seems to want to duck this. I mean, like he ducked the debate last night. I think that the ice sculpture was a more effective prime minister than and he has been for a long time. <laughs> let me... But yes, as, to answer the point about social care. As, as deft as it was to refer to an ice sculpture about, when talking about, about social, social care, care. let's uh, head back to the so topic in Mike question. So Henry would want to see an integrated NHS and social care system. And, and we have uh, proposals for that in a manifesto to put forward so that, so that the care that someone receives doesn't... People don't fall between, uh, between two stools. My grandmother... Uh, died recently. She was 100, and she, uh, towards the end of her life, she kept on falling an awful lot. She was in residential care and then in, in uh, nursing care, and uh, the, the people looking after her were fantastic, but gosh, the frustrations when the two systems just didn't join up properly. So we would want to see a fully integrated so, uh, health and social care uh, system, and for there to be parity in terms of the conditions and the pay that's given to people in the two sectors, because okay. of how vitally important that is. But in if, if I could very quickly if I could just very quickly though point out uh, that I'm afraid that the labour record of the, managing the NHS in Wales is not, I wouldn't Let's say not it's ahead that. of the curve. I want to ask but, a specific yes. question that I put to Stephen which is the perspective from our listener who is thinking how different would it be for me or my mum or my dad or whoever it might be if, if your outlook became policy, that's what matters here I think for anyone, especially older people, that the most important thing is that we give, we treat them with the dignity that they deserve. And so it, in terms of how things would be different, if health and social care were integrated fully together, then it would mean that services would talk to one another. Okay. It would mean that the people, again, wouldn't be falling between two stools. Uh, ben Habib of the Brexit Party. Well, I think that... Um one, just coming back to HS2 very momentarily. No, 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 we no, would, no. no just for, oh, there's a purpose. We would abolish HS2 and we would save the 100 billion that it's going to cost and we would use that as part of a package including the dividend Brexit, the Brexit dividend that we would get when we leave the European Union. 
um, which we estimate to be about £64 billion, we would use that. Not in I, can, I can evidence all these numbers. We, can, we would use that to invest in the NHS and social care. I agree completely that they both need further investment. <laughs> Everyone's laughing, but let me just make it clear to you. The... the um, the, the uh, HS2 is going to cost £100 billion. Does anyone disagree with that? Well, hang on a minute. Let, let's not no. get into the economics if of you HS2. Were to, if you were to abolish it, that would free up a significant amount of capital which we wish to invest in the north of England and in Wales. Okay. We've got £12 billion okay, okay. No, no, I'm allocated gonna, I'm to gonna, Wales to let's, build let's more doctor down, surgeries let's and Let's drill down to the care. specifics of the question. Yeah. It won't come as a surprise, this, because I'm yeah. putting it to you all. Yeah. I want you to talk to our listener who says... They have an experience at the moment of social care and they want it to be better. How would it be better if your plan was implemented? Well, you that's have, all that you matters. Have to, first of all, you have to be able to afford it. The problem with Labour's plans is you can't afford anything. No, no, you're talking anything. about other parties. So, Talk about your own party. Yeah, I am talking about my party. So we would, with the money we would save with the abolition of HS2 and the Brexit dividend, which I'll evidence in due course, I hope, um, we would invest in doctor surgeries across, across uh, Wales. Uh, we would... We would marry it up with social care and make sure that Wales had a proper provision. OK. Um, let's talk to Grant Shapps of the Conservatives. I'm looking at page 12, Grant, of your manifesto, talking about social care, talking about the need to build a cross-party consensus to bring forward an answer. Uh, and um, you talk about nobody needing care should be forced to sell their home to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's pretty vague, this, isn't it? You were stung last time, two years ago, by being rather specific. Um, this time, you've, you've, you're, you're quite vague. And therefore, people don't know what they're going to get if I, it's a Conservative I, I noticed the bit you miss is that we'll put a billion pounds a year uh, extra into... Um, uh, to what end, to, to social care, uh, in order to stabilise the current system. And then our plan is to get together with the uh, other parties. And we think that social care is a bit like the NHS. If you don't have a consensus about this being, in the case of the NHS, a service which is always free at the point of use, which is a national consensus, if we don't have that with social care, which, as other panellists have described, is an extension to the NHS. In fact, it's very difficult to tell where one bit stops and the other bit starts. It exactly. is the same thing. Yeah. If we don't sit down as a parliament, as, as, a, as, as, as parties and come up with a, a solution that is actually durable, then all will happen is it will chop and change every time a different party comes into place. So we're going to put a billion pounds a year in to stabilise the system. Immediately, if we win the election, uh, invite the other parties to sit down and discuss a long-term solution to it. And our only condition to that is at the end of it all, it should not be the case that people have to sell their homes, having saved all of their lives, in order to pay for it because they got one kind of illness and somebody else got a different type mm -hmm. of illness that the NHS would deal with. And in terms of the time frame for the cross-party talks and whatever emerges out of that, are, are you committing to delivering whatever comes out of that by the end of, by the, end of the term? That's exactly it, and that's why we're saying a billion pounds a year over that period of the five-year parliament. And we invite the other parties, if we're elected, to constructively work on this together. It's quite clear from solutions that have been drawn up so far, and we've been through the deal not reforms and many other processes, and you mentioned the, <laughs> the last manifesto, thank you, all of those <laughs> things, that if we don't get a national consensus on this, then we will never seriously tackle social care, and it's time to sort that out for this whole country. Grant, if I could just very no, quickly... No, no, no. We I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on to another question, uh, but Dalith, I am going to bring you in first on this uh, question that is coming uh, in a second. Uh, just a quick nod, uh, if, you, uh, if you're wanting to lap up even more politics than even any questions and any answers can provide, uh, the Election Cast and Brexit Cast podcast, which I'm afraid does feature me, um, <laughs> is available to download on BBC Sounds and is also on Radio 4 on a Saturday lunchtime, sorry, on a Saturday morning at 11 o'clock during the uh, general election campaign. That's enough blushing for me. Let's take a question from Michael Anderson. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, would you support Wexit? <laughs> if, if, you're listening on, if you're listening on long wave, that was Wexit rather than Brexit. Um, I think there's only one place we can start, Delith, on this, not least because I see you gave a speech to the SNP conference uh, a month or so ago suggesting that there was an opinion poll that had claimed 41% of Welsh people supported independence. I haven't seen any other opinion polls that have got close to that. Um, it was a YouGov poll in, a poll in September. Which was also asking people about Brexit as well. But anyway, yes. uh, make your case. 
for, oh, for, for uh, so Wexit, the new word has already been coined. That's good to hear. I mean, certainly, I think that I, I mean, my view on this is obviously clear. I think that Wales should be an independent nation. People across the political spectrum, including ma many members of Stephen Kinnock's party, have become into curious in recent months. And I think that if you look at the chaos happening in Westminster, a lot of people are starting to conclude that we would do things better if we had the levers of power ourselves. And... So how does it uh, how does it happen? Set out your so vision. So we've we very recently set up an independence commission, uh, and I'm very glad that I'm going to be on that commission. That's going to look at all of the difficult details because I'm not for a second advocating that we would tomorrow become independent, but we need to start looking at this because looking at what's happening constitutionally in the UK at the moment, it is very likely that Scotland will vote to become independent. Look, goodness knows what will happen with Ireland. We might be facing this as a default. We need to put the plans in place now. So, uh, yeah, certainly. And but some of the questions that we will be looking at will include uh, something which I know that Stephen has brought up a lot of times before, the, 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 the tax uh, gap then, the fact that we don't raise uh, enough revenue at the moment in taxes in order to fund public services. Now, what I would say, I just want to, because I can see that Stephen's writing things down here, I know that he's going to say that we can't afford it. Now, don't you think the fact that we have such a dire economic situation in Wales is proof of why we need to have these controls ourselves? Why on earth are we under a Westminster system that has allowed us to be in such a, a terrible situation? Just to quote uh, an alternative opinion poll from the one I cited at the start of this discussion. Oh, well, they always come with uh, health warnings. Well, there was, well, they all do, I agree. But there was one from earlier this year, ICM for BBC Wales, finding support at 7% of the electorate, <laughs> which suggests you've got quite a lot of persuading to do. And even if we split the difference between the two numbers quoted, there's still, uh, do, you, do, you, do you accept that there's, there's one heck of an argument that you still have to make in terms of convincing people? Oh, of course. And, and part of this independence commission, we're going to be t hearing from citizens' assemblies. This is not something that the political class can decide and impose on people. We need to have conversations, to hear from people what it is that we want to do differently. And by the way, when I talk about independence, I'm not saying I want independence as the means and the end for itself. That's not the end of the journey. I want independence so that we can start to make our own decisions and things that actually will improve the lives of the people of Wales rather than being at but the bottom of the wrong... But if you're making your own wrong... decisions, that is a means to the end of independence, isn't it? I mean, that's what independence means. Well, no, independence would be the start of the journey. Okay. Independence is not the whole purpose. Independence just starts at us allowing to make our own decisions. Okay, uh, Stephen Kinnock for Labour. Well, um, I just think that it is impossible to see how uh, you make these sums add up, Delith. I, I don't really see that as a credible uh, proposal at all. And of course, we've also got uh, the possibility of Brexit. And if the UK does leave the European Union, uh, and then you continue to advocate independence for Wales, you'd be an independent Wales outside uh, the United Kingdom, which is also outside the European Union. And I, I don't see really how it's a true uh, argument of based on Welsh patriotism, and I'm a, I'm a proud Welshman. I'm also very proud of the fact <laughs> that in 1999 the Labour Party created uh, devolution and the Welsh Assembly came out of that. I want to see more devolution. I want to see more uh, powers given uh, to Wales and to the Welsh Assembly where they make sense in terms of making decisions as close as possible to the citizen. Uh, but where does it's that not, stop making it, sense? It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not patriotic to be putting up walls. It's not patriotic to be putting up uh, borders between the United Kingdom and the rest of the country. Look, look, look at what we've just uh, created, the Advanced Manufacturing Resource Centre up in Broughton, with co collaboration with Sheffield University, a great example of cross-border collaboration between Wales and England. If I could just make one other point, which is much more a point, I suppose, about global politics and geopolitics. Next week, we're going to have the NATO summit here in the United Kingdom, and we're going to be seeing a dangerous world out there because for one thing we're going to have Donald Trump uh, coming to this country was a pretty dangerous thing in itself but uh, let, let's let's be clear we've got power blocks out there now China Russia the United States the world is 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 it's about having the leverage and the power that you need to be able to stand up for yourself okay. is that really a time to be leaving 
uh, our United Kingdom, which is because we are stronger uh, together. And let's think about that NATO okay. summit and think about Wexit when that takes place next week. Dalit, I will come back to you at the end of all of this, given that the questions, are, I guess, all heap in your direction on this particular question. Uh, Grant Chaps for the Conservatives next. I'm a passionate uh, unionist. I really believe that we are um, better together as a, a family of four nations, a fantastic um, history um, together. I'm incredibly sad to see um, Wales uh, split off, or actually any parts of the um, union. And I'm actually just not sure that, you know, when we talked about sort of the divisions in politics and in society and all the rest of it, I'm not really sure what all of this is actually in the end going to achieve. We mentioned before, um, Delitha, you were talking about um, Wales and why you can't have a north-south railway line. You can if you want to. You've got transport for Wales. I've just double-checked it. It's run by the Welsh government if you want to do those things. A lot of the power's are already there to do Grant, them. I just don't understand why... What generations transport has been governed why, by Westminster why, why, why all of the lines go from on, Wales on, to hang England. Hang on, hang on. Let, let Grant finish his point. And actually, let me put a point to you, Grant, actually, mm. about the specifics of, of Welsh politics. Would a Conservative government... Um, give more power to the Welsh Assembly? Well, there's, all, there's powers coming uh, across all the time, actually. So, for example, in transport um, areas, I work very, very closely uh, with whoever is in the uh, Welsh Government to try to facilitate, not least, actually, a lot of the things which happen to be um, cross-border um, and a lot of those roads, the A A55, I think, and other roads which, you know, are and, But any, any specifics of, of, of powers that you would volunteer, hand over from Westminster to Cardiff if there's a Conservative Government in a fortnight's time? So we haven't, we haven't put in a whole new um, raft of um, devolution but what we have said is we'll carry on doing what we do which is to produce and provide those powers which as a Secretary of State I'm using all the time to provide okay. uh, power for, for, for Cardiff to do as it likes with all of the service which is a run I just think we're stronger together okay. and this idea that we have to break ourselves up into smaller and smaller units to be successful, I don't know, I imagine there are some unionists listening <laughs> to this somewhere uh, Let's bring in uh, Ben Habib You're a big fan of Brexit, what do you make of Wex well, I'm a, I'm a wholehearted unionist, and I, uh, I don't think there's any appetite in Wales um, for uh, independence. And I think one of the, one of the great, one of the, well, the polls don't show it, and one of the great sadnesses of Boris Johnson's deal with the European Union, contrary to what he says about the United Kingdom leaving whole, actually we will be leaving Northern Ireland behind, no longer in a backstop, but effectively behind potentially in perpetuity, in the single market, effectively in the single market, effectively in the European Union Customs Union, and effectively under the jurisdiction of the ECJ. Okay. And that, I'm afraid, <laughs> to, that, I'm afraid, provides a model, provides a model not just for Scotland, but also for Wales, and I think it's a really okay. dangerous step that the, that the Conservative Party wishes to take. Literally two, two sentences, Grant, given that that was a, a, an accusation lobbed in your direction. Not much to do with Wales, I don't think. No, it, it wasn't vastly to do with Wales, but I'll leave the listener to come to their own conclusion on, on that. Do you want to respond to Ben's point about Northern Ireland? Oh, well, no, the whole of the UK would leave the EU as one... Uh, as one item. And there's a border down the well, there's, but I'm afraid the borders, the, okay. the sea is there. That's not of our doing. But the no, whole but of the okay. United okay. Kingdom okay. would okay. leave in one single go. There will be go. customs right. checks across and that border and Northern time, Ireland will be subject to the jurisdiction of That'll the do. European Court We're going to squeeze in one more question. <laughs> Thank you both. Okay, I'm going to come briefly back, back to Delith and, and address a point specifically that Adam Price uh, your leader talked about, where he talked about colonialism and Wales in the context of the UK. Is that language you would use? Well, just quickly, if I could come back to the point that's been made, and I will then, uh, of course, come back to very that, briefly. that word. Very briefly. But I would just want to say that we don't want to break up Britain. We want to remake the relationships within Britain. OK, address and, the question and that about There's nothing intrinsic in the state of affairs that keeps us poor. Address the point uh, and about in, colonialism, please. In terms please. of colonialism... Uh, I, I think that the, the substance of the point that Adam was making in terms of the fact that this is an extractive economy that has that Wales is a country that is rich in natural resources and that mainly okay. line treasure coffers, I think that is a perfectly valid point to make. Okay, let's, we've got three minutes left and we're going to squeeze in one last question from Chris Possel. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris Possel. Are any of our current politicians worthy of the term statesmen or stateswomen? We've got four of them on the panel. Um, let's see if we can pick people who aren't in, aren't in your own parties for this and keep it brief, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, where should we go? Grant Shapps first. 
Wow. Well, I think the answer is yes. I mean, the, the truth is that most people go into politics, including, I'm sure, everyone on this panel, because you actually want to make your communities, make the country better. And very few people go in for any other reason. I think we're on a dangerous approach if we think that... Well, I think it is a dangerous approach. If you think that people go into politics and give of themselves to try to do anything other than make the world a better place, then I think you are actually mistaken. That's the intention when people go in. Now, you might talk about how the system then corrupts it. And, Can we have and a name? I would say somebody like Yvette Cooper, uh, if I was going to choose somebody from the opposition benches. Stephen Kinnock. Let's have a conservative from Stephen Kinnock, I think. Um, well... I thought that there were lots of great uh, Conservative MPs, but unfortunately, Boris Johnson sacked them all. Um, <laughs> what a... y you know how to get a round of applause in this room, but what about one who's still actually a Conservative? Um... What, I, I got a bit confused as to who was allowed back in and who wasn't. Was, was, oh, come, oh, come on, come on, Stephen. If we're going to talk oh, about Rory people Stewart. leaving I, I, the party, I, what I about think... the people who've left your party because uh, uh, they couldn't stand the anti-Semitism? Uh, uh, okay, okay. I, I, know, let's, let's, let's actually concentrate on that. Do you want to offer a name, Stephen? I, I, I had a lot of respect for Rory Stewart. Uh, I think Rory was a fantastic parliamentarian, uh, excellent at the dispatch box, really good at reaching out to colleagues, and, and a, I, I would say a credit to, to his party. On the broader question of... Uh, of statesmen and stateswomen, I, I think it is very difficult in this sort of 24-hour uh, rolling news, social media, everybody trying mm -hmm. to win an argument on the basis of, of sound bites. And I really worry about the quality of our political discourse. Okay. I've been knocking thousands of doors in my constituency, really worried about the feedback on the doorstep, okay. about how people feel that our discourse has been degraded. Okay. And I really, really hope... I really minute. hope after this general okay. election that we can start to rebuild trust We've in British politics. We've got one minute left, and my contribution to political discourse is ensuring that everyone gets in. Uh, so, Dale, the jewel of Plaid Cymru. Uh, so, very quickly, I... I I think that we've lost a lot of decency in politics. I think that that's something that we have to get back. In terms of a person, for many years when I worked in Westminster, I admired Jeremy Corbyn very much for, for being a conviction politician, and I'm truly quite devastated that he has lacked conviction on this defining issue of the age. That, and I'm not trying to make a party political point. It sounds like one, but you've made it anyway. Uh, ben Habib of the Brexit Party. Well, I'm going to finish where I started, which I think, saying again what Dorothy just said, politics is broken. I can't think of a statesman actually in any, on any side of, of the House of Commons. Not a single which, one. Not a single one, that are particularly not the leaders. And, you know, when you look... Um, one thing I'm very disappointed about is we haven't had a You've chance to discuss Brexit. Seconds. We haven't had a dis chance to discuss Brexit. But when Boris Johnson says that under his deal we're going to take back name control or... of our cash... Okay, our laws okay. and our borders, we're, we're not. not. Get a name. Okay. And this is the potential okay, future thank Prime you. Minister of the existing much. and potential thank future you. Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Benabib, thank you. Thank you. Thank you from South Wales. We'll talk to you next week in Chesterfield. Thanks for listening.